Hello fun people, today we're breaking down the full story of every villain from the Lilo and Stitch saga. Who are the aliens who threatened Lilo, battled against Stitch, and attempted to take over the universe? Well, there's no better place to begin than with the big dummy himself, Captain Gantu. By the way, if you're interested in exclusive weekly live streams with me, early access to new videos, and the ability to chat in our community's private Discord server, consider supporting the channel over on Patreon, which is linked down below. Now it's time to pull back the layers of the alien who at first seemed so hardened and tactical, but was revealed to be a sad, sensitive, and burdened man. How did a high-ranking officer of the Galactic Armada become a loyal henchman of one of the most nefarious villains across the universe, Dr. Jacques Von hamster veal. Well, that happened because Gantu was a broken person. Gantu stated in the first episode of Lilo and Stitch the series that he came from the eighth planet of the Keplock system, and through his conversations with his pal 625, who would eventually be named Ruben, he shared that his childhood was filled with heartache. Honestly, this whole video was born out of me beginning to do research on Ruben, but once I started to see how complex and tragic Gantu's life had been, I knew I wanted to explore it in its entirety before I broke down the life of 625. You see, Gantu's father specifically instilled in him a need to not trust anyone and pressured him to believe that everyone would abandon him because he would always be a failure. Run away from the boring failure! Run far away. Daddy always said they would. Gantu's father ensured that he would grow up respecting authority and following his orders, which led to Gantu internalizing his father's hatred of others and himself. And the more Gantu despised who he was, the more alone he became. My father was very authoritarian, so I didn't have many friends. No friends, actually. At the age of 12, Gantu remembers distinctly being excluded from his peers' parties, and the following year, he was burdened with braces. Even the girlfriend he had throughout school named Sinta remembered how he never had taste and was always unfashionable. He was a total social reject, but nevertheless, he did find his way into sports and graduated well enough to be able to join the Galactic Armada. Unfortunately, though, that decision to become a protector of the Federation did come with a heavy price. Perhaps if I had married her instead of joining the Galactic Armada, my life would have turned out better, but my foolish pride wouldn't allow it. Most likely with the desire to earn the respect of his father, Gantu attempted to show his superior leadership, competency, and strength by rising to become captain of the Galactic Armada, so he set aside his dreams of love. Through Gantu's interaction with Mr. Stenchy, it's clear he appreciated the warmth and kindness the little experiment had, and he wants to take care of someone beyond himself, but for the longest time he refused to pursue it so he could continue to follow orders of the influential people around him. Gantu grew up serving as father, and he began his adult life by carrying out the commands of the Grand Councilwoman. Captain Gantu, take him away. With pleasure. But of course, one experiment completely derailed Gantu's career. Stitch escaped to Earth from the starship Gantu was captaining, and even when he was given the opportunity to redeem himself, he not only failed to apprehend Stitch again, but his aggressive and impulsive actions endangered the lives of numerous innocent people, including Lilo. The hatred he held for Stitch only grew as he realized that the little abomination and his tiny human friend were able to humiliate him, which of course led to Gantu being forced into an early retirement. All of the prestige and power he had sacrificed for was gone, and that left Gantu wandering the cosmos searching for a new master to serve, enter the alien who funded the creation of 626, Dr. Hamsterveel. Now, with all of this context around Gantu's life, I don't think he decided to align himself with the despicable Jacques von Hamsterveel because he suddenly turned evil and wanted to rule the universe. I believe he became a mercenary because he wanted revenge against 626 for playing a part in dismantling his career. He was desperate to find a place where he belonged again since he struggled socially throughout his childhood. And most importantly, I think during that extremely vulnerable period of Gantu's life, he returned subconsciously to the familiar toxic reality he grew up in. Gantu once again submitted to an abusive figure who would dictate his life. And sure enough, once he became Hamsterveel's henchman and started collecting experiments, he was constantly berated, mocked, threatened, and ridiculed. Did that bring me an experiment soon? I will abuse you physically as well as verbally! 
Understood, sir. But deep down, Gantu was only hostile to Lilo and Stitch because of the painful experiences in his past, and he hated that he allowed himself to be controlled by it. When the experiment Amnesio erased all of his memories, including all of the traumatic ones, he instantly became kind, compassionate, and responsible. He even took on the persona of a police officer and did everything he could to assist Lilo, but when he found out that if his memories returned, he would be thrusted back into a life of darkness, he struggled to see how he could have allowed his life to progress in such a different direction than the life he wanted. Who am I? I'm lost. Gantu desperately wished he could have a fresh start and a second chance. Stop! Please! Let him go! I don't want my old life of evil back! Even after he received his memories again and became a servant of Hamsterville once more, he held onto the ceramic statue Lilo had given him to remind himself of who he once was and who he wanted to become. And later on, when Lilo attempted to convince Gantu he was delusional after he hid his head, he fully embraced the Uncle Chester persona she placed onto him, since he was hoping that his life had actually been a horrible fiction. Gantu longed to escape his life because he saw no purpose in his own. I was really hoping I was Uncle Chester. His life had some modicum of meaning. Of course, there were times where Gantu completely rejected Hamsterville's commands when he felt empowered or he felt compelled to break free from his boss's grip. Like when Gantu won the lottery because of the experiment named Shoes, he immediately got rid of Hamsterville from his life. Hamsterville, you stink and I quit. Or when Gantu attempted to become the king of Earth with the use of the experiment named Checkers, he completely shut Hamsterville off. But when his plot was undone, Hamsterville welcomed Gantu back to be his servant by forcing him to perform humiliating and degrading tasks. Every time Gantu failed to escape Hamsterville, it seemed even less likely he would ever be free. Each time he tried to gain courage within himself, his confidence and self-esteem would be degraded again. With Gantu's life seemingly crumbling around him, he just couldn't see what he was even working towards, and he feared there would never be a time that he would be able to escape. I've had power before, it left me empty. Gantu didn't know what would make him happy, which is why when he's given the ability to wish for anything, he squanders the opportunity as he wishes for all of the luxuries he could imagine and the ex-girlfriend he had romanticized in his head. All the riches in the world and you still feel empty? <sighs> I remember that Gantu struggled throughout Lilo and Stitch the series, but once I started to see it all together, it was just heartbreaking to see this literal giant alien be constantly burdened with so much pain. In little doses, it was hilarious, but lined up, it was tragic and fascinating because the truth was that Gantu despised his own existence. I hate my life. Now, of course, while Gantu was going through all these painful trials, tasks, and emotions, he did have a little sidekick to keep him company. After 625 was rehydrated and Gantu became trapped on Earth, the duo became quite the little team. They weren't the most productive, they weren't the nicest to one another, and they definitely didn't seem like they would have ever chosen to be roommates, but through their time together, they did become friends. 625 was willing to hear Gantu's problems. He became invested in their bond, which is seen through him being jealous when Gantu prioritized his friendship with other experiments, and they were unafraid to joke with one another. Through all the egg salad sandwiches they shared together, there was a mutual respect that was built up. So when the day came where Gantu was fired by Hamsterville when an army of Leroy's had been built, it was Reuben who helped guide him down a new path. Years of devotion and hard work, and this is how I'm rewarded? You are right, big guy. That gerbil treats you like a pile of blitzneck. With a true friend by his side, Gantu saw that being fired was his opportunity to escape the abuse he had been suffering. This was his chance to start a new life where he would refuse to go against his own morals in the search of power, riches, and respect. It was time to ignore the people who had held him back and to rise to be the greatest version of himself. So he decided he would help Lilo and Stitch bring an end to Dr. Hamsterville's reign as a threat to the Galactic Federation. He's on the Aloha team now. You never did understand the meaning of Aloha, did you? Sure, Gantu might have served Hamsterville in the fight for Jumba's experiments, but when there was a true intergalactic threat, he played his part to save the day, transforming himself into a hero. With his legacy restored, the Grand Councilwoman offered him the ability to return as captain of the Galactic Armada, but he refused to accept until he knew his true friend would continue to be by his side. Captain Gantu may have seemed like just a violent, corruptible big dummy, but the truth 
truth was that he was an alien who had been tortured, isolated, and demoralized his entire life, who just wanted to prove to himself that he was capable of being a good person and finding a friend. I'd like to request experiment 625, <coughs> I mean Reuben, as my galley officer. No kidding? I've grown rather fond of your egg salad. Gintu broke away from the path of the bad guy in part because Experiment 625 was able to be a consistent and supportive person in his life, and Gantu was able to provide that for 625 as well. Without Gantu, 625 may have never been able to break out of who he was programmed to be. I need to know our coordinates. I just got us a deal on a bunch of baloney. You see, Experiment 625's life began within the laboratory of Jumba Jukiba. He was secretly developed by Jumba and financed by the evil Dr. Jacques von Hamsterville under the nose of the Galactic Alliance. Now, what's special about 625 is that he is the last failed experiment before the creation of Stitch. He was designed to possess all of Stitch's powers, including being fireproof, bulletproof, and he could think faster than a supercomputer. He could see in the dark and lift 3,000 times his own size, and he even had advanced language programming, but his only instinct wasn't to destroy everything he touched. Instead, he accidentally was programmed to be lazy. That meant he avoided physical combat or using his powers, and even when he was placed into structured situations, he refused to apply himself. I took a class in advanced applied blasting. Hey! Oops. Sorry. 625 was far from the ultimate evil monster Jumba hoped he would be, but he wasn't necessarily completely good either. For the most part, 625 just didn't care about anything other than sandwiches. 625 was obsessed with sandwiches. He loved eating them, of course. He'd wish for sandwiches when he was able to and fight to get sandwiches whenever he could, but he also became great at making them. It was kind of the only thing he was intrinsically motivated to do. Unfortunately, he's also a lazy coward, <laughs> but makes great sandwiches. Ham or tuna. But of course, even though 625 was a failure for Jumba, he didn't throw him out or disintegrate him. 625 actually became Jumba's assistant. In the Disney Adventure comics, he was depicted for some reason as a little blue alien who helped Jumba manage the other experiments. Since he was the precursor to Stitch, that kind of makes sense that he'd have a similar color to Stitch, but of course, in Lilo and Stitch the series, he has his own iconic yellow color. Now, 625 had a lot of fond memories serving Jumba. Like, 625 would recall to Gantu how 262, the experiment who turned out to be pure good, was always locked in the basement when Jumba's friends came over. Oh boy, was he embarrassed. <laughs> Supposedly, 625 was also able to be involved with the creation of Experiment 626. But unfortunately, the good times with Jumba wouldn't last long. In the lead up to the Galactic Armada arresting Jumba and seizing his lab, Jumba dehydrated his original 625 experiments into pods and placed them into a container computer for safekeeping. When 626 inevitably escaped custody and Jumba was sent to apprehend him, Jumba was able to smuggle all of his experiments to Earth, but they wouldn't stay safe there for long. Eventually, Hamsterville hired Gantu to be his minion and sent him after Jumba in the experiments. And while he wasn't able to find the container computer at first, he was able to find one experiment pod, which turned out to be 625. Without knowing that 625 was not a serious threat, Hamsterville rehydrated the pod in hopes of using him as a weapon. He believed 625 could be the key to getting Jumba to reveal the location of the experiments, and he hoped 625 would be able to help Gantu capture them as well. But 625 could not be bothered by Hamsterville's commands. He had no fear of the gerbil-like alien. As soon as he was back in his hydrated form, he returned to making sandwiches and refused to intervene in the squabbling over the experiments. I mean, even when he was on board Gantu's ship, when it was shut down and on a path to crash land on Earth, 625 was just happy to be eating a shockingly good sandwich. Ah, grilled cheese. After Gantu's ship crash landed on Hawaii, it became very clear to Gantu in 625 that the ship was unable to be flown, which meant that they were stranded on Earth. And even though 625 didn't really care about the outcome of who captured the experiments, he decided to play along and accept his role as Gantu's sidekick. Looks like you and I are working together, huh? Sandwich? 
And right away, it seemed like a great deal for 625. With Gantu as a roommate, that meant Hamsterville was paying for their rent, their food, and even their cable subscription. The two aliens shared a bedroom, they'd play checkers and card games together, and sometimes just lounge around and watch TV. When Gantu was out hunting experiments, 625 typically kept himself busy by watching the Sandwich Channel and reading Sandwich Aficionado. And one time, he got himself a pet cockroach named Jimmy. Gantu, though, hated seeing 625 doing nothing around the ship. It's time you started pulling your weight around here. You see, Gantu saw 625's potential. I mean, he knew how powerful 625 could be because he fought Stitch every other day when he was going after the experiments. And he sometimes got so frustrated that 625 was willing to completely squander his abilities. Do you ever stop to think what you could accomplish if you gave up sandwiches? See, that's the diff between you and me. You are a fighter, while I am a lover of sandwiches. But Gantu wasn't willing to put up with 625's excuses for long. He eventually started dragging 625 around on missions against his will and 625 hated it. He especially did not like getting beaten up by Stitch, but there was one thing that allowed him to keep going through all of the pain, exhaustion, and embarrassment. Now, I can't believe I did this for sandwiches. But then again, sandwiches. The frustration for 625 was the fact that he knew Gantu didn't actually need him along most of the time, and he made sure Gantu knew that. In hopes of being left behind, 625 made fun of Gantu a lot for needing him around. For the most part, he just got in Gantu's way. When it comes to hunting abominations, Gantu never loses. Except when you lose, which happens to be most of the time. Again, 625 just acted like he didn't care about anything at all. But the truth is that he did have some fun doing criminal work with Gantu. Bad guys win this round. Oh. <laughs> but unfortunately, those moments were few and far between at the start of 625's friendship with Gantu. Most of the time when 625 and Gantu were interacting, 625 was laughing at Gantu's expense. Like 625 snitched on Gantu to Hamsterville when he attempted to avoid hunting an experiment. 625 was also more than willing to kick Gantu in the keister when he was delusional and believed he was a chill guy named Uncle Chester. When Hamsterville demoted Gantu to 625's assistant, he was ecstatic to put Gantu to work helping him produce sandwiches, and he used the experiment named Swirly to hypnotize Gantu into performing humiliating stunts. I mean, a great example of how common it was for 625 to mess with Gantu is how 625 handled the TV. You see, 625 was so unwilling to help Gantu that he refused to record Gantu's favorite show. Record it for me? Well, I could do that. But I'm thinking the Sandwich Channel. <laughs> After years of being friends, though, 625 genuinely seemed to change his ways. I suppose I'll miss the big season finale. Want me to record it for you? You wouldn't mind? Hey, what are friends for? Now, I thought this was such a great moment because it seemed like a sign that 625 had actually grown to be attached to Gantu. But it turned out not to be the case. 625 just lied. He actually didn't record the show. And that made me so sad. I really thought he had changed. But what about your show? Sorry, didn't get it. But the truth is that sometimes 625 was just cruel to Gantu, especially when he target Gantu's biggest insecurities. Like he called him a failure. Your life is a boring failure! You said you wanted to hear it! I didn't think it would be so tedious. And 625 told him he was a loser. Uh, associating with this la -hooser is not doing wonders for my rep either. And he even made fun of his weight. Not funny. Looks nice. Helps disguise a few of those chins. The poor big dummy was consistently and brutally torn down by 625. That's why when Gantu got a sliver of power, he'd often get some revenge on 625 by turning him into his servant. 625 became Gantu's janitor when 627 was Gantu's sidekick. When Gantu had his experiment army, 625 was reduced to a butler and was used for target practice. And in an alternate future where Hamsterville took over the world and Gantu was able to rule Earth, 625 was Gantu's personal secretary. But in those moments where Gantu's ego would get out of control, 625 was definitely there to undermine him. Like he ratted out 627's weaknesses to Lilo, and he overthrew Gantu with a ton of his cousins when Gantu crowned himself as king. 
But for how dysfunctional their relationship was, 625 did truly care for Gantu and their friendship. Like 625 makes Gantu sandwiches every day. When Gantu was turned into a baby by Experiment 151, he defended the little guy from Hamsterville. He'd tuck Gantu in when he was napping and 625 would even talk with him through the tough times. Hey, 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 you obviously had a bad day. You wanna talk about it? Plus, 625 was hurt when he felt like he was being replaced by Experiment 254. He did not like feeling like his contributions to Gantu were being underappreciated when Mr. Stenchy was showered with love and attention. Does he toast your bread for you? Hand slice your pickle? Does he? Does he? 625 was also legitimately hurt when Gantu suggested that he never actually enjoyed his sandwiches, which makes sense. I mean, so much of his identity is built around sandwiches. Of course, it would be devastating to hear that the one thing you actually love to do is something you're absolutely terrible at. Gantu Schmantu. Who needs him? Nothing but a pain in the patookie anyhow. Didn't even like my egg salad. And what I think is important to understand too is that Gantu was the only friend 625 had for a long time. One of the other hard things for 625 to accept was the rejection he faced after falling in love with Experiment 624. Her spell doesn't work on us, but we fell for her just the same. He struggled to cope with feelings of inadequacy and loneliness, and it didn't help that she chose Titch over him. I mean, that's never a fun experience to go through. But throughout that, he still had Gantu. Across the three years 625 lived on Earth, all in all, he had a pretty chill existence with someone who was a loyal pal, and he accepted that life. I guess the one place I belonged was with my blubber butt buddy, Gantu. But that era of 625's life seemed to fall apart when Gantu left him behind. You see, in a final effort to impress Dr. Hamsterville, Gantu went and broke him out of prison. With Hamsterville free, they were able to pressure Jumba into creating a new evil experiment named Leroy, and after creating an army of Leroy clones, Hamsterville began to take over the galaxy. But 625 wasn't included in those plans. Sure, 625 was technically free to make and eat as many sandwiches as he could ever dream, but lounging around, gorging himself, and creating distractions weren't going to fix the emptiness he felt. I think he was going through a similar experience to what Stitch did in the original movie. When Stitch had nothing left to destroy, it became clear to him that he had no greater purpose in his life. What must it be like to have nothing? And after 625 fully submitted to his lazy tendencies, he realized he had nothing too. He tried to claim that he would just convert Gantu's ship into a sandwich shop, but that's not what he actually needed. It was only when Lilo showed him some kindness by bringing him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and giving him the name Reuben that he finally began to see that there was meaning in being a part of an Ohana. You're number 625, the closest one to Stitch. You just have to stop making sandwiches and start making something of yourself. After being inspired by Lilo and her conviction to save the galaxy, Ruben sprung into action. In an instant, he allowed all of his powers to be unleashed, and in an afternoon, he was able to completely repair Gantu's ship for operation, which I think is absolutely hilarious. Gantu had been trying for years to get his ship in working order while he was stranded on Earth, and 625 literally just watched him struggle and failed that whole time, even though he knew how to get it up and running. That's just a classic 625 thing to to do. Now using Gantu's ship, Reuben flew Lilo to the homeworld of the Galactic Alliance, Planet Turo, where they soon discovered that Hamsterville had already successfully overthrown the Grand Councilwoman. Gantu was then ordered to imprison the duo, but Reuben hoped that he could get Gantu off the path he was following. After so many arguments, jokes, and hurt feelings, Reuben finally decided to genuinely and openly support his friend by asking him to embrace the aloha spirit that he had found with Lilo. And much to Ruben's delight, Gantu decided that his little sidekick was right. I'm breaking you two out of here. Aloha. Aloha! Whoa. With the help of Stitch, Jumba, and Pleakley, Ruben hitched a ride with his new friends back to Earth to defend his cousins against Hamsterville and the Leroy army. Once the battle broke out, Ruben fought the Leroys with sandwiches, and he inevitably jammed out on a saxophone to help exploit a defect within Leroy and his clones. Playing Aloha Oi successfully deactivated Hamster Veal's army. For being a part of the team that saved the galaxy, Gantu was offered the honor of returning to his position as captain of the Galactic Armada. But he had one request. 
he wanted to keep his favorite little trog by his side. Experiment 625 may have began his life as a lazy, unmotivated, and sandwich-loving alien, but through his friendships, he allowed himself to rise to his full potential. He pursued the path of good, he embraced an ohana, and he decided that his one true place where he belonged was as a supportive sidekick for his best friend. But of course, Gantu and 625 were only henchmen and pawns for the true evil mastermind, Dr. Jacques von Hamsterveel. He's the former partner of Dr. Jumba Jukiba, the co-founder of Galaxy Defense Industries, and the primary financier of Jumba's illegal genetic experiments. He's definitely not a gerbil, and his name isn't Hamster Wheel. Hamster Wheel, it is Hamster Wheel! He's the most evil rodent in the galaxy, and is the true big bad villain of Lilo and Stitch's epic story. Now, as a very small creature in a very large universe, Hamster Veal is desperate to find some way to gain some kind of power and control over his life, or really anyone for that matter. You see, when the experiment knows he found Hamster Veal's diary, it became clear that Hamster Veal was just looking for some kind of comfort in his life. Did you know Hamster Veal sleeps with a pacifier? And he was very insecure about a hidden dandruff problem, and not too surprisingly, his height. He also wears platform shoes to make him look threatening? I mean, Hamsterville loathed himself so much that he didn't even go by his real name. Hamsterville's real name is Rupert? Enter! To attempt to prove how formidable and capable he could truly be, he became a ruthless, ambitious, and evil being by going to school. You see, Hamsterville's journey truly began when he attended Evil Genius University. There he met and befriended Jumba Jukiba, and after they both graduated as scientists, they went into business together. Their first enterprise was a business called Jokes on You, but they eventually set their sights on an opportunity much larger than pranks. They decided to attempt to manufacture the most evil monstrosities the universe had ever seen. And to accomplish this mission, they formed Galaxy Defense Industries. Jumba was positioned as lead scientist scientist, while Hamsterville found creative ways of financing those evil genetic experiments. Remember the old days? You creating experiments, ah, funding them with my shady business deals. The duo's first successful creation was Experiment 001, which had the capability of shrinking and enlarging enemies. And after that, for the next 25 years, Hamster Veal and Jumbo worked together. Throughout that time, they successfully evaded authorities, truly only sharing their research with other members of the Evil Geniuses organization. But even though Hamster Veal and Jumbo were building an impressive collection of experiments as a team, Hamster Veal was constantly cheating embarrassing and stealing from Jumba because he didn't plan on keeping him around forever. Hamsterville's plot all along was to have Jumba build him an army of evil monsters that he could then use to overthrow the Galactic Council and rule the entire galaxy. But Hamsterville didn't want anyone around who could potentially take control of the experiments for themselves, and since Jumba was their creator, Hamsterville knew he had to get rid of him. To accomplish this, he ratted out Jumba to the Galactic Federation to ensure that he would be detained. And sure enough, while Jumbo was charging his 626th experiment, authorities were sent into his lab to arrest him for illegal genetic experimentation. But I actually don't think Hamsterville exposed Jumba on his own schedule. You see, when Jumba was arrested, his lab and all of his research was seized by the Galactic Federation, meaning that Hamsterville couldn't just remanufacture all of the previous experiments. And when Jumba was permitted to live on Earth, it's revealed that he had secretly held on to the 625 experiment pods that came before Stitch. If Hamsterville had tipped off the authorities to arrest Jumba, there's no way he wouldn't have first ensured he he had control over the experiments. So what might have happened? Well, I think Hamsterville was actually arrested before Jumba. In the prison block where Jumba was being held, we can see a silhouette of a creature that looks just like Hamsterville. While it's not confirmed that it's him, if Hamsterville was in custody, that could have prompted him to give up Jumba in hopes of gaining back his freedom. But it doesn't seem like the Grand Councilwoman would take that deal since Hamsterville was in charge of keeping cash flowing into the operation. If they cut off the money, all the illegal activity would have eventually stopped. But there's another interesting fact to consider in all of this. When Jumbo reunited with Hamsterville in the future, Jumbo revealed that he believed his former partner had died. Hamsterville is alive? 
With all of that in mind, here's what I think happened. After Hamsterville was arrested to buy himself time, he ratted on Jumba, and when he wasn't able to secure his freedom, he faked his own death so that he could escape prison and continue to evade the Galactic Federation. I think Hamsterville hoped he would be able to find the experiments and take over before he was arrested again. To attempt to capture all of the experiments, Hamsterville then commissioned the help of Gantu, the former captain of the Galactic Alliance, who had been recently retired after being unable to apprehend Experiment 626. While Gantu failed to find all of the remaining experiment pods, he did find one, Experiment 625, and he was the one who brought together Hamsterville and Jumba again. Of course, Jumbo was unwilling to give up his experiments though, which led Hamsterville to go mad. He tried to torture Jumbo, but nothing was able to get through to him, so he eventually threatened Jumbo's life. Hamsterville notified Jumbo's new Ohana on Earth that he would be willing to exchange Jumbo's life for the remaining experiments, and everyone was okay with going through with that trade, except for Lilo and Stitch. At the meetup, Lilo and Stitch intervened and not only were able to save Jumba, but they fought to save Stitch's cousins, leading to them to free the experiment pods. In Hamsterville's mind though, if he couldn't control every experiment, he knew another way he could win that only required him to possess one dangerous experiment. I will now clone him and create my own personal army! By cloning Jumba's most powerful and evil creation, Hamsterville knew that he would be able to generate an unending number of monstrosities, and for the longest time that meant he desired to clone Stitch. Using his patented cloning process, Hamsterville hoped to cut Stitch in half to study him completely, but before Stitch was destroyed, Experiment 221, otherwise known as Sparky, saved his cousin's life, making Sparky the first of Stitch's cousins to be reformed. Stitch was then able to rescue Lilo, and together with Sparky, they crashed Gantu and 625 on Earth and brought Hamsterville back to the Grand Councilwoman, who then imprisoned him in the Xenon Sector on Prison Asteroid K-37. While Hamsterville was in prison, he primarily pursued his original goal of bringing the experiments to the side of evil. But he would not forget the idea of cloning one perfect evil creation. At one point, Hamsterville even connected with Dr. Draken, yes, from Kim Possible, the clone Stitch. In the past, Dr. Draken had explored cloning on numerous occasions. Most notably, he was able to clone Kim and Ron to create powerful minions, but at the time, they were easily destroyed. Are you certain this machine of yours is going to work? It will! Soon our guests will be replicated a thousand times over. Of course, Draken was unable to clone Stitch using his own device, but again, the concept was not completely abandoned, and eventually, it would become the path Hamsterville would choose as he attempted to rule the galaxy. Until then, though, Hamsterville modified his cell to be able to control his criminal activities from prison. By speaking a single phrase, his cell would transform into a hidden headquarters right underneath the nose of the Galactic Federation. Even the experiments that were sent to Hamsterville were able to be stored and hidden away within the wall of his cell. Using their powers, I shall break out of this pepperoni-smelling prison and take over the stinky galactic alliance! Throughout Hamsterville's time in prison, Gantu continued to be his henchman with 625 as Gantu's right-hand man. Together, they competed with Lilo and Stitch to retrieve the experiments as their pods became rehydrated. But unfortunately, Hamsterville had a pretty dark management philosophy. It doesn't matter if your minions like you, they only need to fear you. Across the three long years Gantu served Dr. Hamsterville, Gantu was constantly abused. Hamsterville always attacked Gantu's shortcomings, calling him fat, pathetic, and a failure, and anytime he could, he'd jump on any mistake Gantu would make with absolutely zero empathy for him. I mean, he even yelled at Gantu when he was sick and was transformed into a baby. The truth was that Hamsterville was just entertained by Gantu's suffering, and while Gantu tried to ignore his boss whenever he could, he could never Never escape him. Maybe Hamsterville doesn't need this experiment. He's in jail anyway. How would he find out if... That's exactly what he said, sir. Maybe Hamsterville doesn't need this experiment. 
There were times when Gantu attempted to retaliate against Hamsterville, though. He did sometimes stick up for himself or blow off his boss, and he did try to quit a few times, but Hamsterville also fired him on many occasions. I have to say, though, the funniest bit of revenge from Gantu was when he was being granted wishes from the experiment Wishy Washy. Gantu used one of his wishes to turn Hamsterville into an actual gerbil, but that was eventually undone. Honestly, though, what I think is most surprising is that Hamsterville was shocked to find out that Gantu hated him and mocked him constantly behind his back. They mostly just sit around making up names for you. Rat face. What? Hamster jerk. What? Keister veal. What? I mean, Gantu just truly hated his life working for Hamsterville, and Hamsterville even got to experience how terrible it was. When the experiment swapper transferred Hamsterville's mind into Gantu's body, at first he hoped it would remain permanent so he no longer had to stay in prison, but after spending some time in Gantu's life, he realized prison was so much better. Now, eventually Hamsterville independently escaped from prison. He stole a police cruiser and made his way to Earth. Why he couldn't teleport himself like he did with the experiments, I'm not exactly sure. But regardless, once he arrived, he was soon imprisoned by Myrtle Edmonds. Now, Lilo's bully Myrtle was so mean, despicable, and evil that when she met Dr. Jacques von Hamsterville, he not only thought she could be more capable than Gantu, but he even offered her a job. Perhaps when you have completed your education, you could come work for me. Unfortunately for Myrtle, though, her first pet was inevitably hunted down and imprisoned once more by the Grand Councilwoman, but Hamsterville did not forget her. Later on, when Hamsterville constructed an advanced alien drone that he sent to Earth, he successfully convinced Myrtle to serve as his minion. Unfortunately for Myrtle, the recruitment was actually just a ploy by Hamsterville to be able to mind control her, to be the perfect experiment catcher, but Lilo and Stitch eventually saved her. Hamsterville did come to Earth again to attempt to create a perfect accomplice for his evil plans though, but this time he was only visiting for a short period while his prison was in furlough. On that trip, Hamsterville attempted to revert Stitch back to his original programming in hopes that Stitch would bring all of the experiments to the side of evil. But of course, even after that, took place, Lilo was able to get through to her best friend fairly easily. As the years went on, Hamsterville became more and more desperate to get out of prison, but he knew the only way that was going to happen is if he got out himself. You see, he could have potentially gotten out on parole, but the Galactic Federation and the parole board knew he was a major threat. We're doubling your sentence, cutting your TV time in half, and removing the free popcorn cart from the break room. What? In hopes of gaining an edge over Lilo and Stitch on their quest to capture all of the experiments, Hamsterville invested heavily into an experiment locator satellite that was placed in orbit over Hawaii, but Lilo, Stitch, and the kids from Recess were able to destroy it. Lilo was not only sabotaging Hamsterville's plots, but she was successfully converting hundreds of experiments to good. But Hamsterville had one hope to undo all of Lilo and Stitch's progress. Experiment 624, better known as Angel, was capable of turning Stitch's cousins to evil again. But when she fell in love with Stitch, she gave up her own bad programming to save his life. The truth was, the little Earth girl was becoming a major threat to Hamsterville obtaining his freedom and his goal of controlling the galaxy. We even learned from the experiment Skip that it was only Lilo and Stitch who were keeping Hamsterville at bay. When Lilo and Stitch skipped 10 years into the future, we find out that across that time period, Gantu had continued to slowly collect the experiments and Hamsterville had been able to receive parole. And when the duo skipped later, they discovered that Hamsterville had successfully used the experiments to seize control of the galaxy which allowed him to declare himself as Emperor. But Lilo and Stitch were able to return to the point where they originally skipped, and that meant that they were back in their original timeline. Unfortunately for Hamsterville, his greatest foes were present to attempt to stop him from overthrowing the Galactic Federation. You see, after Lilo and Stitch freed all of the experiments that Gantu had successfully captured, and they found the one true place where all of the experiments belonged, Gantu decided he needed to prove his worth once again. Gantu personally broke Hamsterville out of prison, but without access to the original experiments Jumba created, and after failing to turn Stitch evil and clone him, Hamsterville determined he needed a new experiment. Together, Hamsterville and Gantu went after Jumba and forced him to produce a new version of 626 for their own nefarious plots. While this new experiment would utilize a lot of the fundamental DNA of Stitch, he would also be enhanced with a variety of new powers, he'd be unable to be turned to good, and he was requested to be red. The experiment was a pure monster whom Hamsterville named Leroy. 
But while it may have seemed like Leroy's creation was a simple task for Jumba, the truth is that he was in development for years. Leroy's story actually goes back farther than I ever initially realized, and truly, he's the culmination of so many different Lilo and Stitch movies and episodes. You see, the experiment that became Leroy was able to be completed soon after Jumba was allowed to return to his lab after spending years on Earth, and if he'd actually started creating that creature from scratch when he arrived to his lab again, he admitted it would have taken him years to get anywhere close to completing a new experiment. Jumba makes genius experiments, not fast food would take years just to create design. What this seems to indicate, which I was completely oblivious to for so long, is the fact that Jumba must have hidden an unfinished experiment within his lab so well that the authorities were unable to find it during their raid of his laboratory. The experiment that would one day become Leroy was hidden from the police and remained dormant in deep space for years as Jumba discovered a family of his own. But even though Jumba had helped rehabilitate 626 of his other experiments, when he arrived arrived at his lab, he continued to develop the abomination he had begun all of those years ago in hopes of creating the ultimate weapon. You see, Jumbo wasn't interested initially at creating a new life for himself and his experiments. He was in pursuit of building a creature that would be unstoppable, but he had continuously failed. The Jumbo's first creation, Experiment Zero, was extremely destructive, but he was also uncontrollable to the point where he had to lock him away on a deserted ice planet. Then Experiment 262, aka Ace, was made too good. He's the Captain America of Jumba's experiments. And others like Experiment 600 were clumsy. 625 was lazy and obsessed over sandwiches. And 626 grew to desire meaning in his life, which led to him finding an Ohana. Plus, all of the experiments that came in between all of those failed experiments had inherited an ability to turn good. All of Jumba's experiments through to Stitch could find the one true place where they belonged, but Jumba was not satisfied with that reality as we got to see in Stitch the movie. Once experiment is turned to good, is completely useless for bad. I'm trying to fix for 627. <laughs> but while Leroy was a follow-up to Stitch, he wasn't Jumba's first iteration on Stitch's design. Why not just call it 627? You already made 627. I did? Shut up! Before Leroy, Jumba admitted that he was in development of Experiment 627 for years. He put a lot of effort in that attempt to create his ultimate monstrosity, including granting 627 a variety of new powers from over 20 other experiments. And he also perfected 627's inability to be deterred from his evil programming. There was now no way to turn new experiments good. But 627 still had a weakness. While Jumba did enhance every part of 627 compared to Stitch, that also meant 627's sense of humor became a little too big, leaving the experiment completely defenseless when he was in a fit of laughter. Still determined to unlock the perfect experiment though, Jumba quickly did create another creature, Experiment 628. But all we know for sure is that the 628 experiment pod exists according to the series. So much for Experiment 627. Perhaps I will have better luck next. Now, personally, I think 628 may be Jumba's most evil creation, even compared to Leroy, because 628 was the last experiment Jumba created without any oversight. It's the experiment that was designed to directly address the downfall of 627, and assuming he had already discovered how to create a purely obedient monster, then 628 would be a pure evil, relentless destroyer who would only be a servant to Jumba himself. But we don't know for sure, so the mystery and powers that exist within that pod may never be uncovered, especially since Leroy was not a true successor to 628. You see, while Jumbo was working on his 629th experiment, Hamsterville took over the operation by force and rushed the completion of the experiment so that he could build an army. Now, it's important to note that when Hamsterville commissioned Leroy, he was completely unaware of the creation of 627 and 628, as those experiments were built without his knowledge while he was in prison. Gantu and 625 never told him Jumba had built any new experiments, so instead of forcing Jumba to iterate on 627 and 628's designs, he requested that his experiment should iterate on Stitch. I want to order a new version of 626. Easy on the fluffy. And I don't like blue, so make him resplendent red to match my cape. 
That's why Leroy resembles Stitch so much and basically only has his powers. Leroy may have an increase of strength and speed, the ability to grow and change the color of his fur, and a resistance from turning good, but otherwise he's Experiment 626. Jumbo only gave Hamsterville exactly what he asked for and nothing more, especially since he was the one who got Jumbo arrested in the first place. You can even see how closely connected Leroy and Stitch are through the fact that they both pick their noses with their tongues. They share the same genetics and instincts Instincts, which technically means Leroy is a less advanced experiment compared to 627 and 628. Again, supporting the fact that I think 628 would be the most dangerous experiment if it was ever hydrated. Maybe if 629's creation wouldn't have been sped up and dictated by Hamsterville, that alien could have reached new diabolical heights. Jumba just never got that opportunity. But regardless, Hamsterville's intervention and a mistake by Jumba left Leroy with a weakness that was very similar to something Stitch had to experience. Errors in the creation of Leroy and Stitch led them both to suffering from glitches. If you remember from Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch has a glitch. The result of Stitch's cells not being fully energized when he first came to life meant that over time he began to break down. His eyes would glow green, he'd lose control of his body, and he began to approach death. And a similar reaction was able to be brought out of Leroy because of the song Aloha Oi. Circuits will burn themselves out like supernova! Somehow, playing Aloha Oi when Leroy was initially formed and charged meant that his mind and body could be disrupted just like Stitch, only while Stitch's glitches were completely uncontrollable and were eventually healed. It seems Leroy's glitches were completely controllable and there was likely no cure. Hawaiian folksy folk music is tied into Synapse Matrix. If Leroy is hearing Aloha Oi, he is shutting down like a car wash in a rainstorm. But before the glitch could ever be recognized by even Jumbo himself, Hamsterville went ahead and cloned thousands of copies of Leroy, which I found extremely fascinating since one of Jumba's experiments, 344 aka Dupe, was unable to identically copy individuals. The clones would only be given a portion of the original's power, leaving the collection of clones much weaker than the original, but it seems Jumba was eventually able to perfect the cloning process through a machine he built, and with that cloning device, Hamsterville had the opportunity to amass a perfect, unlimited, obedient army of Leroy's. The original Leroy was then made Hamsterville's enforcer, who was tasked with capturing Jumba's experiments, which meant that Gantu was finally permanently out of the job, while the clone army was sent to topple the Galactic Federation. Hamsterville took over, and all that was left for him to do was to eliminate the experiments as Hamsterville believed that they were the only force who could topple his new empire. Aloha! As in... Goodbye. At that point, it seemed like the Galactic Federation would fall, that the universe would soon bend to Dr. Jacques von Hamsterville, and that even Jumba's previous experiments were no match for Leroy's might. But Leroy was not prepared for the power of Elvis Presley. Once a glitch within Leroy was discovered and was able to be exploited, the army fell apart. Hamsterville was taken down by the experiments he had tried to abuse and control since their creation, and he was locked away in a cell in an alien high security prison. But fun people, who is your favorite villain in Lilo and Stitch? Honestly, I find Ruben to be hilarious, but the entire tragedy surrounding Gantu's character I think is just fascinating. They added so many layers to him through the series, but I have to say I am also very impressed with how Hamsterville and the story of Leroy were able to tie the entire saga together. I mean, for me, Lilo and Stitch is one of, if not my favorite Disney movie, and the series meant so much to me growing up. And I say that because I truly just think it's amazing that I'm able to come back to all of these stories and see that they all held up. I still laugh at so many of the jokes, I still connect to so many of the characters, and I just love the world. Finally, I'm Isaac Carlson, thanks for watching, and... <laughs>